Okay, we're back here live at EMC World for SiliconANGLE and Wikibon's exclusive coverage of EMC World. Three days of nonstop interviews, day two's in the books, 45 interviews, 19 more today. This is SiliconANGLE's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the silly from the noise, and bring the data to you and share that signal with you. I'm joined my co-host Dave Vellante, and we have Jeremy Burton, the Executive Vice President of Product Operations and Marketing. You were the CMO, now you're running product operations. You're running the whole show here at EMC World. We interviewed you on The Cube when we was born in 2010, when you just started EMC. What a journey and transformation. Yeah, Congratulations. Seems, seems like a long time ago. <laughs> Only three years. <laughs> <laughs> so the show gets bigger and bigger. It has the Jeremy Burton uh, uh, fingerprints all over it. You and your team have done an exceptional job. The feedback here has been great. Um, very clear messaging. Uh, yeah. You've always said, hey, I'm about the messaging, making it very clear. Big fonts this year. Yeah. Bigger impact. Really big fonts. Uh, big fonts on the screens. And, but people are happy. They're really good with the, the story wor is working. Yeah. Yeah. And the feedback has been phenomenal. So give us the update on the show, just some stats and just some things that, that are happening that are notable. Um, yeah, we, well with the show, what we've tried to do over the last few years is, you know, we would always hold a lot of ancillary events and we've tried to roll those all into EMC World. Um, so, you know, this year we've probably got, you know, between nine and 10,000 customers and partners here. This is, you know, people who actually pay money to attend and like you guys. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, then we, we, it's a technical show, right? And so we use the uh, fact that we've got our best technologists here to do our TC conference, that Chad, Chad obviously is our leader of the, of the TCs. So there's about you know, 2,500 people uh, here from the TC community, and then obviously there's a lot of guys out of R&D and EMC employees who help put on the show. So it all adds up to about you know, 14 to 15,000. Well, Tucci, Tucci uh, was talking about on stage how proud he was from how the show evolved from originally a technology right. uh, show to uh, now, obviously, transforma transformative show now. Um, so, so obviously the tech is important and the messaging's there, so people look at the messaging saying, great. How do you bridge those two together? Obviously, you have to balance that and try to get a clean alignment of EMC, which is now a new transformed company. Going back to 2010, mm -hmm. we've seen the transformation as a company, software-defined data center, that aligns beautifully with what yeah. VMware's doing and where the market's going on software find storage, all these things, and with Internet of Things that ties in the, the pivotal mm -hmm. acquisition. So, you know, you got four companies now. Joe Tucci's yeah. proud. Yeah. Um, now, the messaging, how are you going to get your arms around that? So, well, I mean, a couple of things. The show, I mean, for, it, it still is a technology show, and, and most of the attendees here are technical. We, we do get a lot of IT management types. Get that sorry, out of the way, yeah, throw it out there. We get a lot of IT management types, but by and large, it's a technical show. And so you've got to keep that core, like 500 technical sessions. Um, I, I, I was just upstairs with the EMC Proven Professional. There's uh, already 1,500 people been through certification at the show, and there's only a 50% pass rate, which you know, means that there's, there's 3,000 people already taken an exam. And, and you know, we've got to keep that, right? Uh, I, I think people are justified coming to a show like this for education. It's going to make them more knowledgeable, more valuable to their organization, and that really is the justification for coming. Um, at the same time, and I think probably now more than ever, it, it, it's more important uh, th than ever before that people understand what we're doing, right? We're big, we've got the VMware thing going on, as you said, the Pivotal thing going on, we've got you know security with RSA and then EMC, and I think if folks don't walk away with an understanding of what who EMC is and why this makes sense together, then uh, things get really difficult really quickly. And, and, and by the way, it's not just our customers and, and our partners, it's our employees as well. I mean, if we, if we can't explain to the company what it is we're doing, and th this actually is the best forum uh, for doing it. Um, so all, all the guys back at work, I mean, we webcast this thing to all the guys back at the office, so it's a, it's a forum I actually think to get our employees on the same page and our customers and our partners, so you've got to dumb it down, you've got to keep it simple, you've got to talk, you know, big elephant pictures. It's easy to get you stripped know. up, there's so much to talk about. You could get, you could go into the weeds pretty quickly with all yeah. that, all those different elements going on with software and all the different brands and companies. Yeah. There's a lot of nuances there, so you're up-leveling it, and, and, and you've done that successfully with Cloud Meets Big Data. That was your yeah. first, I think, big move from yeah. that we saw was, okay, let's simplify, Cloud yeah. Meets Big Data. How have you expanded that? Because again, you're adding more on to it. What, what, what did you put on top of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the thing that is generating just a tremendous amount of interest is uh, security, and, and, and in particular, um, not, not just security, but the whole area of IT trust. Um, I, I think most organizations feel like that's one of the biggest impediments to the success of cloud or big data. Um, the security world is, I think, undergoing massive change. 
And w yeah, I mean, if, if you want a topic to get access to an executive suite or a boardroom, just go talk about security. And we didn't feel like that element was like strong enough in the story. We've got a great asset with RSA. Um, we, 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 you know, been working on a product refresh uh, around the security analytics tools, and you know, really building those underlying big data technologies in. And we felt it was, you know, the right time to, you know, really elevate that component um, of the story. So, Jeremy, yeah. a lot of people obviously think of you as the marketing guy. You even, sort of, in a self-deprecating way, on stage the other day, positioned yourself as the marketing guy. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're actually very much involved in the product side. I remember my first exposure right. to that was last November when you presented what was then called Project Born. I think I told you my jaw dropped. Um, yeah. Not only because it was you presenting it, but the level of depth <laughs> and the, the boldness of, of the vision. But so I like to start with the why. Yeah. Why are you doing Viper? Why are you going to this software defined? What's the heart of that? Yeah, I mean, the, certainly the, the research that we've done suggests that, um, look, over the next four or five years, you're going to get um, growth in existing or traditional applications. We think they're going to grow, you know, maybe 70% over the next, you know, in total over the next four years. Mm -hmm. But we also see the emergence of um, a bunch of applications that are architected differently. And, and, and we see hyper growth in those applications. So you've got a couple of things going on. There's an existing architecture for the traditional apps and there's new architectures emerging for a lot of these next gen apps. And we don't believe, these next gen apps are, are, are way more uh, kind of uh, uh, attuned to being deployed in a, in a public cloud architected system. Now, we, again, data, our research that we've done suggests that um, uh, a large portion of those apps are going to be deployed in private cloud environments, but using a different architecture. Um, I'll put another way, I think a lot of companies would love to walk up to Google and say, hey, if I give you a million bucks, can I buy all of that software that you've written and apply it to my data center so I can run my data center like yours? Um, why? Because they've got workloads that they just can't go and put out in the public cloud, and, and nobody's done that to date, and so obviously Amitab, with his background and experience, he's built one of these things, and so I think Viper is the first commercially available software package that is going to allow data centers to adopt this web scale model of, of uh, data center operations, um, but you know, in, in their own data center environment. And you know, the nice thing about it, it's going to be the newly architected apps and the existing apps that'll help them manage. It's the nice so. thing and the hard thing about it is you're going to include all, <laughs> all the existing stuff. Yeah. I, I think about Oracle Fusion apps and I go, oh my God, the yeah. integration there. So a lot of work going on there. Yeah, it's a big project. I mean, Amitab, you know, he, he, but he's used to large scale development. He ran a little thing called um, <laughs> Windows, right? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it, it is a large project and it's a bold vision, but I think we've got you know, we've got the team to pull it off, and I think a lot of the stuff we build ends up, um, you know, kind of leaking out, um, and people see it coming. I think Viper's one of those things that maybe snuck up on one or two of our competitive friends. Well, that's going to change the whole competitive landscape. We could talk yeah, about yeah. that, John, but I know you want to jump in oh, here. Well, yeah. I got to ask, because you're, you're yeah. the, the king of messaging, because you have a good vision on the marketing side, and you yeah. understand the products, yeah. you have you, you got the story right. We, we have been reported that yeah. earlier. The story's absolutely right on the money, and you've introduced some things late in the game, messaging, and, and that's a good flagship for the employees in the marketplace. Um, so I, we asked Amadab on earlier, uh, yesterday, we kind of were riffing on this idea of back in the 80s and 90s when the land error, as Joe Tucci puts it, based Phase mm -hmm. two or whatever, era two, yeah. um, the lower end of the OSI stack was standardized. OSI, and, I and, know and, that and word. You remember, remember the seven layer model, yeah, right? Yeah. So remember, and it really never, above TCP IP, yeah. it was just kind of in Wild flux. Mm -hmm. But underneath that was all standardized, and that exploded massive wealth around internetworking and you know, 3Com, so they're all were born, right? So a lot of wealth was created mm -hmm. and great things. So, so, but back then, in the vendor community, it was multi-vendor was the messaging. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're multi-vendor, you work together, and that spawned great, uh, great uh, vendor Olympics, as Dave always says. But now in today's market, it's open and choice, and it's kind of fuzzy. How do you put your hands around open and choice? So the question is, how do you get your arms around what is today's version of multi-vendor? OpenStack seems to be very interesting out there. It's an mm -hmm. open source community. So I'm talking about we were talking yesterday is that open source seems to be now the the multi-vendor message. If you're playing in open source yeah. and can be open, mm -hmm. but not open source, that's the balance. So, so how do you look at that? Because you got that's a complex topic. What does open and choice mean? Yeah, I, I think to me some of this speaks to you know architecture. I mean, at, at a very high level, there are some natural seams in the infrastructure. I mean, I think the 
the virtual layer for me is it's a natural seam. It, it abstracts the hardware and it allows you to run any application on top. And we, we've really organized the company around these natural seams. You know, you, you've got uh, EMC information infrastructure as, as, as Joe's uh, now kind of ordained it. Um, that, that's kind of below the virtual layer. And we want to be able to have folks manage uh, storage arrays in, in a very, very consistent way and being, by being very public about the interfaces that we use, right? That's number one. Number two then, obviously you've got you know, VMware focused on this virtual layer and then you've got Pivotal. Again, there's a natural abstraction for the applications. And so you know, we feel like, okay, it's not like ultimate choice at every level, but if you want to use a different virtual layer or if you want to do, use different infrastructure, you know, the, the architecture that we're proposing allows you to do that. I mean, obviously, we'd love everyone to buy EMC storage. We're not advocating, you know, <laughs> go get a healthy blend of, you know, third-party storage and get on with it. But, you know, if you've got, if you're thinking about your data center architecture, think of the virtual layer as an abstraction from the infrastructure, and think of the applications as an abstraction from the virtual. So, layer. if multi-vendor was box-specific, yeah, in those in that era, yeah, in the modern era we're in now with software. It's how do you play multi-vendor? I mean, I mean, how does that? It's software. Is yeah. it open source? Is it? Well, you're, you're, I think you're kind of religious about supportable interfaces, right? I mean, you know, if you want to make those interfaces public, if you want to make them open source, I mean, that's another step as well. But the, I think the difficult thing with open source is being is knowing exactly where to draw the line because you know the way the uh, license is written at times. Yeah, once you hook a little bit in, like <laughs> you kind of fall in. Lock in. Well, yeah. Doctor well, Lock in. Well, but, I, mean, <laughs> we, I mean, we can't have it. If every piece of IP that EMC builds falls into open source, then we have, we don't have a sustainable business, <laughs> right? We can't we can't pay engineers then. Uh, if everything was free, we can't pay engineers to go solve the next customer problem, right? So there's some intellectual property that we feel is, uh, you know, proprietary to us that we want to charge money for, but but interfaces. Uh, should be open. Uh, I think you know TCP/IP. Lots of implement, ver various different implementations, but very you know common interface uh, to to what is above. And I think we've got to take that mantra: the interfaces that VMware surfaces, the interfaces that our storage arrays uh, surface. That they've got to be standard. They've got to be consistent. Yeah, and there are models where you can you can do 100% open source and make money, be a 100% service company, but that's <laughs> be slitting your throat, which makes no <laughs> sense. Uh, but so Amazon has turned the data center, this complexity, into an API. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing the same thing now with your storage vision. Yeah, back, back to oh. what John was saying, actually. So so you know Viper will support the Amazon APIs. Right. Right. Um, so uh, and and also look we. I think HDFS is, is probably going to emerge as the de facto access method. We'll, we'll support that. We, you know, that's not an EMC API. That's a, an industry one that, that we will talk so that it keeps the customer's option open. But so. you're basically putting forth a vision where you're saying, okay, we've got all these controllers that you need to buy to. This, yeah. here's, a, here's an open interface through an yeah. API. So that, you're creating a platform and, and, yeah. and changing the definition of what storage is. Yeah, Vipers are definitely a platform play. It's an architecture and a, and, and a platform that we think is uh, extensible because there will be new storage arrays come along, make no mistake, there are many startups out there. And I think Andy Brown put it really eloquently with uh, from UBS, uh, they track 132 different storage vendors. He's going to bring new storage vendors into their architecture, and he want, but he wants to be able to provision them and manage them in a very consistent way. Yeah, so that notion of platform, as I say, I think changes the way people consume and program to storage, and there aren't a lot of companies that could create either a de facto or some other standard. I mean, yeah. you got EMC, IBM, HP going OpenStack, mm -hmm. and you've got NetApp, you know, yeah. who's, who's in the mix, and, and you know, do they have the juice to actually create a platform? EMC clearly does, but yeah. you've got a tremendous amount of work to do oh, yeah. between now and, and sort of getting there. The easy bit's done, yeah. we did the announcement. Yeah. <laughs> we got to deliver the product. Oh, you did a good job yeah. at that. That's uh, not so easy yeah. all the time. You know, yeah. It's maybe easy for you, but, uh, yeah. but no, nonetheless, David Goulden says, well, we've got 70% of the market to get to. Is this how you plan on, on getting to the other 70% other or other 30%? Yeah, it's certainly, I mean, again, at our size, 20 billion, we're, we're yeah. certainly not as big as the IBMs and HPs of this world, but you know, we've got to open up new doors and, and new avenues to, to revenue. And I think embracing um, you know, third-party storage, commodity storage, it, it, it might not have the same margin structure as our current business, but it's growth. And I think you know, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it, and we're going to be playing defense instead of playing offense. And again, the thing I like about EMC right now is, we're, we're, I mean, Viper is a very offensive move. 
um, yeah, there's some risk because I think some of our existing business, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it'll be a counterpoint to, but again, if, if we don't do it, somebody else will, and so I'd much rather be driving that train than following it. Well, and you say your margins are, but the, the gross margins will be substantially higher, but you obviously have volume to <laughs> make that from <laughs> Well, I mean, margins are very interesting, right? Because there's, there's, there's kind of margin point percentage and then there's margin dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, right? And if you don't have any margin dollars, the percentages are relevant, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we care about margin dollars badly. You know, hey, if the percentage is a bit less, then, you know, it will accept it if we if we can capture it's the a mathematical calculation yeah. that comes out of the business model. So yeah. Jeremy, obviously, you know, we, we always use the phrase on theCUBE, you know, the sizzle and the steak, you know, on the barbecue, you know, you guys have all the sizzle, get the messaging yeah. right, the story's home run, um, the steak is the products and the operations that you're running. So yeah. um, talk about the what you're what you're seeing there, because we had another theme that come up that's come up early in the first two days is the whole solutions market. Yeah. I mean we've had you know Tom Roloff and his team on and amongst others, channel partners, there's a huge amount of trust yeah. on the deployment side as people start uh, de deploying hybrid clouds. So I want you to comment on how you're aligning out that group, but also on the product side, there's new use cases. So we had you know, Brian Gallagher on, Rich Napolitano, mm -hmm. what they're seeing is they've got growth in their business. So you know, mm -hmm. so much for that downward spiral that's happening. So there's, there's new use cases emerging. Yeah. What are you uh, eyeing right now in the marketplace? Because you are watching the story, you're watching the trend lines. Yeah. New use cases are obviously coming on board. Which ones are you seeing as a slipstream that you're going to ride heavily? Yeah, I mean, and this is not the first time that uh, it's probably been mentioned, but, but certainly, I mean, a lot of interest around VDI. I mean, I think you know, that wave has been promising uh, for quite some time, and it's never kind of you know, hit the beach. Um, but there are certainly signs that that is, is, is building. Um, obviously, you've got very different performance uh, profile and requirements for the VDI use case. Uh, we're also seeing in, in like test and dev environments, massive database consolidation. Then you've got very random, you know, kind of I.O. and workload patterns, and that presents a very different challenge for traditional uh, storage arrays. Um, I, I mean, we see kind of new use cases almost heading towards high performance computing. I mean, the thirst for IOPS and bandwidth, and I think this is where some of the server flash technologies uh, start to play. Um, I'm pretty fortunate that I've got a guy in my team, John Rose, I think you've, you, you guys have spoken to him. Uh, John's been great, he's come in. Um, he's and, not a storage guy. He, he's, not, he's a systems guy, he's, right? Yeah. He, he's very broad. and. You know, when, when you've got a guy like Pat Gelsinger, who you know is a is a you know technological uh, you know, brain the size of a planet, uh, you know when he goes off to VMware, that that leaves a gap. And um, I think someone like John, what we've tried to do with with John in the CTO office is pull it much more central to product strategy, um, have him understand the use cases, uh, have a forum with the various different engineering teams, so that we can vet out what our strategy is going to be, and then lock and load on what the way forward is. And that, that helps in the go-to-market later. On the organic and M&A, both? Uh, yeah, in both, in both. Uh, and, and, and we, I think one of the healthiest thing about EMC is the attitude towards m and You know, we, we almost look at organic and inorganic development you know, through the same lens. It's another way of achieving the same goal. You know, I mean, Viper, very, I mean, organic development, yeah. um, say, you know, EMC as a big company, do we innovate? Viper, you know, all, all organic, but then, Look, we're acutely aware there's going to be people outside the company that are going to do a better job in certain areas and we've got to use our balance sheet to, to get access. But John's played a good role because, you know, we've got a broad portfolio. Not all of that portfolio is relevant to every solution. Not all of it is relevant to VDI. Not all of it is relevant to database consolidation. And so my job for probably the next, you know, 18 to 24 months is try and get a lot of focus around SAP solutions, Microsoft solutions, VMware solutions, Oracle solutions, um, solutions that we're going to go sell to uh, service providers. Yeah. Uh, and can we pull a thread across the company and have all of our different teams, Tom Roloff Services Organization, the marketing organization, the sales organization, to, to really get after uh, those solution areas. So. Yeah, the foundation of EMC seems to be settling in. You start to look at that, and you know, Dave and I always speculate on the cube every year about you know the future of EMC. Who's going to take over? Who's going to do this? But but one of the comments we've always talked about was even going back to the past two years is look at the bench of talent that EMC has at the time. You you yourself. Gelsinger, Moritz, mm -hmm. Tucci, Goulden, it's like wow, that you got all those guys in one yeah. group. That's you know, that's you got heavy hitters all there. Now it's settling on nicely. You got Moritz with Pivotal, mm -hmm. Gelsinger is at VMware, you and, and Goulden, the team, John, and, and you know, the, the Microsoft guys. Well, I, mean, well, I think Bill Scanlon running sales is is one of the best guys I've ever seen. So <laughs> take us through that 
transformation within EMC of just over the past 12 months with, with Pat going to VMware, with Paul got a clean canvas to paint uh, the future of the data management in Pivotal. Um, how's that all shaking out? I mean, it's settling in so we kind of know what it is, but how do you see it evolving? from a product, from an EMC out perspective. Yeah, I think this is where, you know, Joe does a, it works his magic, right? I mean, he, you know, he's, uh, he can bring the right personalities in, he can blend those personalities into a team and figure out, you know, who the best person is for the, for the particular job at a, at a point in time. And I, I have to say, I think, although there's been a lot of change internally, uh, we, we've not missed a beat and um, it's different. But you know, I think different is good, and I think when things are different, it, you know, so I, I think personally for myself, I, I mean, I always do my best work when I'm outside my comfort zone doing something different. And I think you know, Pop Palmer, it's probably the same way, right? Fresh challenge, small company. Hey, take it from where it is today and, and be the next VMware. Uh, you know, Pat going into his first CEO role. I mean, he's going to be invigorated. So. The, the change has been a positive, and then we brought in new folks like John Rose from the outside to help really be the guiding light on the uh, on the product strategy side of things. And look, I, I picked up a bit more responsibility um, along the way. So, uh, and what we're trying to do, and, and you're scaling the team. Yeah, we're scaling the team, and also as a big company, you know, a lot of big companies they make the mistake of trying to be small, like oh, we're too we're too big, uh, and we've got to break the company up, and. Um, I, I feel like the success for a big company is proportional to how many of the pieces you can align. So if, if we've got a handful of solution areas and we can align the entire company, sales, services, marketing, and R&D behind that, then we can you know, beat most people. Uh, because a lot of big companies, and I think there's some pretty good examples out there, they've not been able to get out of the way of themselves to capitalize on the opportunity. And, and I, I don't see that you know, within EMC. Yeah. Dave and I always talk about you know, how companies grow. You ratchet up one group, or this group, or you clean this room, then you move to the next room. Yeah. So, so obviously you guys have done a good job on VMware, it's settling in, Pivotal's yeah. clear, clear mandates, EMC's got this. What within EMC do you see that's going to be the next kind of ratchet area that you want to ratchet up? Is it, is it the services and the, and the solution side? Obviously, you know, here install base is huge, they're all buying more and more drives, yeah. and so now IBM has a real big services business. Yeah. You guys are expanding that area. You got R&D. What, what's next? Products, I mean, 2014's yeah. a big product. Year it it, it is, yeah. and, and look, I, I think we're very clear about this, is we're only in the services business um, because a lot of our customers expect us to you know, install and advise them on our, our products. I mean, we, we also partner with a lot of the big six. We, our, our intent is, is not to be a big SI. So you're going to see the, the, the primary focus be on the product side of things. I mean, look, I think all flash arrays are going to be big. We've got Extreme IO uh, coming later this year. The, the early reaction from the customer base has been fantastic. That's a big deal. I loved Rich Napolitano's pitch earlier today, uh, the fact that he dragged a bunch of guys out of his labs. There's some amazing stuff coming in, in VNX. Um, Guy Churchwood, another fellow Brit, um, he, uh, he's, he's, he's a funny guy and he's doing some pretty amazing things in the world of backup. Uh, so th that's exciting. Um, on the go-to-market side though, I think you, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. We've got to go from selling product to selling more of a solution. And, and by the way, our channel partners want that as well. And so one of the big transformation areas on the go-to-market is to be more solutions-led versus uh, product-led. And Tucci obviously wants that technology, so you're clear, channels there, yep. Good, no channel conflict, have that solid, and lead with the products. Yeah, I mean, the, from, a, from a, you know, where we invest and what, what do we think first about, it's we, we got to have new technology to solve the new customer problems that we're seeing in their environments. We have a few short minutes, so I just want to kind of, while you're in the cube here, just kind of riff, and we always try to get the magic going here, but uh, you know, you've been impressive, you like to try new things, um, you've been a great friend of the cube, I want to kind of give you a shout out while we're here, but also you're, you're pushing the envelope in marketing, right? So you yeah. still have your heart in marketing, yeah. as you know, the product is, 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 is a new area for you, you're, you're doing well there and got that focus. But the future marketing. You know, we were talking off camera last night about you know, the publications and the broadcast, because all the changes going on. Yeah. You guys have EMC TV and Force, it looks like CNN. Um, obviously we're envious uh, in terms of the production values, and your budget's a little bit bigger than ours. But uh, <laughs> you know, what do you see as a future market? You've always had a great vision of like ours, like go direct to the, control the mm -hmm. narrative, you've always said that. What's next, how do you see, what's around the corner for, for new things that you see enabling uh, EMC. Yeah, the, I mean, there's some things that are going to be very much the same, but there's some things that are just going to be very, very different. I mean, I, I've got a great guy on my team, Todd Farsight, that I've worked with for many years. 
uh, works on Jonathan Martin's corporate marketing team, and we, we want the marketing team to be more data driven. And, it, and as marketers, it, that is a very tough pill to swallow because you got a lot of type A's, people like to be busy, we do stuff because we feel like it's the right thing to do and we like to be busy, but you let in the data drive the activity, that, that's what it's all about. And so um, really, you know, we, we, we've got a data science team within marketing, we have about 150 terabytes of data that we analyze, we're trying to build propensity models to, to better target our marketing campaigns. And you know, marketing, if you go back 10 years, it was much more of an, uh, an art than a science. I think today, if, if you're not into the science of marketing, you're going to end up out of a job. And, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, marketers are spending somewhere between two and 10% of revenue. And the CFO's got to ask the question, hey, if we spent nothing and I took that the bottom line, would that have a better, a greater impact on the stock price? Um, so that, that to me is one, big thing that that is good and, and I can see it you know changing kind of before my eyes um, obviously you know um, you know social and you, you know the video and people's attention people have got the attention span of goldfishes today right okay. um, and and you know if you're not delivering content in a fresh new way I mean part of the kind of infographic feel of the keynotes is people are attuned to consuming information in a, in a, in a different way and uh, I, and actually, I want to change it all again next year as well. The big screen's great, but I feel like it's had its day um, because you know the way people consume information, I, th I think, is changing, and we've got to you know we've got to stay current. But the one thing that I, I would say is going to be consistent and, and, and the same is is the message. And you know, if you I mean, I see it time and time again. It, when companies get that wrong, it's a kiss of death. You know, the messaging. Yeah, it, the, the message, so the clarity of message and what the message is and why, how it's differentiated, if, if um, that, you know, that, that, that art and that skill is, is, is still going to be precious. And the entertainment side of it, with some feedback from, I've been seeing on Twitter here, is that you know, EMC used to be kind of arrogant, you know, kind of being polite there, uh, but here it's not. <laughs> They're confident and open, and there's a lot of entertaining things here. And you know, some shows just, I mean, it, People want to be entertained. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your vision there, because you have some nice stuff here around making it a good experience. Yeah, I think folks come into the show, uh, yeah, they want to be educated, but they want to have a good time. And uh, I think the nice thing about the EMC team in general, I mean, if you can go into the the bar, uh, you know, late at night and you can hang with Joe when he said that he wants to shake everybody's hands. Um, and it'll take 20 seconds. I think. I think on the on the casino floor last night, he spent most of his time <laughs> shaking hands. Abe Lincoln. But uh, <laughs> so I think making executives a you know approachable. I mean that's part of who we are, and I think that sets a tone for the show. And then you know if you go into the exhibit hall there, we've got a lot of different divisions. We don't tell them what to do. We say, look guys, we've got this superhero theme. Be creative within that envelope and do something fun and different. And and what I've seen if. If you can set the right environment for people and say, look, it's okay to take risks, creativity is okay, everybody's got it within them. They just don't often think they can take the risk or they can be creative or they've got to have some brand cop approve something. We don't have any brand cops or people walking around stopping folks being creative. You know, it's encouraged and uh, you know, applauded. Mark Zuckerberg always says break stuff and that how things get done, so that same philosophy here for yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Burden, final word I'll let you get and then we'll break here as we're pushed on time. Just give a quick uh, sound bite on the show, the vibe, the success, the positioning. Yeah, we came here to do one thing really, which is to um, let, lay down a foundation around software defined storage. Um, we, we had a great new product offering to do it. Um, you know, I, I was very concerned going in because it was so new, people wouldn't understand it. I think people do understand it. Um, it's been the biggest EMC world ever. Uh, we've got more of the bloggers and the press and the analysts here than we've ever had. And the acid test is, a, you know, are people having a good time? And we've still got Bruno Mars to come later, so uh, the, big, the big act, I guess, is still to come, but people are having a good time, I'm and sure, that's the... I'm sure you got a good deal. You always pick the winners first on that deal. Now he's popular, price would have went up uh, had you gotten them a little bit later in the game, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that <laughs> Jeremy was Burton, Executive Vice President of Product Operations, and also the CMO, uh, the man behind the, the re-energized brand, his team doing a great job. This is theCUBE, we are exclusively covering EMC World three days, we're day three. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, we'll be right back with our next guest right after this short break. <laughs>